Welcome to the module on Volunteer Geographic Information, or VGI as it is often called for short. VGI is an enormously important recent development in spatial computing, and familiarity with VGI will be integral to your ability to understand spatial computing and to apply your spatial computing knowledge. Now, in this module, we're going to have the following five learning objectives. First, uh, by the end of the module, you should know the definition and historical context of volunteer geographic information. Second, you'll actually be able to contribute volunteer geographic information yourself to some well-known VGI repositories and databases. Third, you should understand the socio-technical systems or the combined social and technical processes that are the mechanisms by which VGI is generally produced. Fourth, you should be able to assess the pros and the cons of VGI for a given problem context. And finally, for those of you in the technical track, we'll go over the basics of using VGI in an app or a website or any other system. OK, so let's get moving here and talk about the definition and historical context of VGI. And to do so, uh, let's go ahead and, and hop in a time machine for a second and go back to the year 2000 or so, which was, unfortunately, the last time I had any hair at all, and which was, much more importantly, in the pre-volunteer geographic information era. So back in 2000, if you were someone who needed geographic information, for instance, an environmental scientist, a demographer, a marketing analyst, an urban planner, a civil engineer, etc., uh, if you were one of these people, you would likely turn to government agencies like the United States Geological Survey or the United States Census here in the U.S., Statistics Canada, across the border to the north in Canada, and so on and so forth. Now, this information would have been produced with, in the words of the famous geographer Dr. Michael Goodchild, elaborate standards and specifications, and by people with documented qualifications. These qualifications might have included a degree, uh, possibly a graduate degree, in surveying or cartography or a related discipline like geography. However, beginning around the mid-2000s, a dramatic change began to occur in the world of geographic information, production, and dissemination. Namely, you all started to create your own geographic information. More specifically, everyday Janes and Joes without documented qualifications and operating outside of well-known standards and specifications, well, these folks began to map things. For example, in 2004, Steve Coast founded the OpenStreetMap project, which aimed, aimed to and has now succeeded at rivaling the expensive government-owned map data in the United Kingdom with data collected by thousands of volunteers who trace satellite images, upload GPS traces, and do many other mapping activities. Now, since its founding, OpenStreetMap has become enormously influential in the spatial computing world. The information produced in open, uh, by OpenStreetMap volunteers, excuse me, now covers most of the globe and is incorporated by, um, uh, in products used by millions of people, like, for instance, Apple Maps uses OpenStreetMap data, Foursquare uses OpenStreetMap data, and even the modern MapQuest uses OpenStreetMap data as well. OpenStreetMap has been so successful that Google has implemented a similar system in Google Maps called Google Map Maker. Now, using uh, Map Maker, anyone, including you, can sign up and suggest edits to Google's base map. For instance, you can see here I was the one who added the location of my lab, Group Lens, uh, to Google Maps. We'll be talking more about OpenStreetMap and Google Map Maker as this module progresses. Around the same time the OpenStreetMap project was launched, volunteers also began to tag Wikipedia articles about geographic entities with latitude and longitude coordinates. This is a process known as geotagging. For instance, you can see here that contributors to Wikipedia have geotagged the article about the University of Minnesota with the appropriate latitude and longitude coordinates. Now, these geotags have become a critical data set. For instance, if you launch Google Earth, you'll notice that you can turn on a Wikipedia layer. Now, this layer is not magically created by Google. It's powered by volunteer contributions of geotags from Wikipedia contributors. And this is a data set that anyone, including you, can download it at any time and can add to it at any time. Now, the research by my students in my lab often takes advantage of these geotags. And I'll be talking more about this later in the module. And those of you in the technical track will actually be using these geotags in an assignment. Now, the mid-2000s also saw the rise of people mapping their world in the form of online geotagged photography. Geotagged photos are regular old photos that, uh, similar to geotagged Wikipedia articles, have an associated latitude and longitude coordinate of where the photo was taken. 
Now, in the mid-2000s, people began geotagging their photos and uploading them to photo sharing sites like Flickr. And by 2006 or 2000, 2007, there were actually already about 20 million geotagged photos on Flickr. Now, this phenomenon has only grown and grown uh, with, for instance, uh, Instagram supporting the easy automatic geotagging of photos. Now, these days, social media other than photos can also be geotagged and shared. Most famously, Twitter allows people to geotag their tweets, and about 1 to 3% of tweets have latitude and longitude coordinates. You can see some of these tweets here on uh, 1 million, uh, excuse me, 1 million tweetmap.com. And this is one of the many websites that uses the public Twitter API to gather geotagged um, Twitter content. For instance, someone very recently tweeted, and you can see this here, about the lovely farmer's market occurring on the uh, University of Minnesota campus on this very beautiful summer day. Now, geotagged uh, social media like photos and tweets have proven to be an extremely valuable resource for industry and for academia. Now, Moore Nauman is a professor uh, at Cornell Tech in New York City and the co-founder and chief scientist of Scene, which is a startup dedicated to extracting stories from social media data. I asked uh, my colleague Moore to describe the impact geotagged social media has had on his research and on his company, and here's what he said. He said the vast amounts of data shared on social media reflect people's attitudes, attention, activities, and interests, offering unique opportunities to analyze and reason about our world and our society. With associated geotag information, these social media items allow us to understand for the first time what people are paying attention to and where they pay attention from in real time. This data can prove hugely valuable to a diverse set of applications, such as improving city management, marketing, journalism, tourism, health, and many, many more. Now, all of these examples of people producing and sharing geographic information, whether they're talking about geotag tweets or OpenStreetMap contributions, are examples of volunteered geographic information. Now, more formally, Michael Goodchild, the originator of the term volunteered geographic information, defined VGI as follows. Volunteered geographic information is the widespread engagement of large numbers of private citizens, often with little in the way of formal qualifications, in the creation of geographic information, a function that has been, has been for centuries uh, reserved to official agencies. They are largely untrained, and their actions are almost always voluntary, and the results may or may not be accurate. But collectively, they represent a dramatic innovation that will certainly have profound impacts on geographic information systems and, more generally, on the discipline of geography and its relationship to the general public. Most of this definition should be familiar to you by now. Uh, for instance, the elimination of the monopoly on the creation of geographic information by official agencies due to the participation of regular old folks, or in Goodchild's terminology, private citizens. Now, these private citizens can be contributors to OpenStreetMap or Wikipedia, or just people that upload geotagged photos, geotagged tweets, and so on. Goodchild also highlights the enormous impact of this change on geographic information systems and geography, two critical components of spatial computing. Indeed, this impact really cannot be overstated. So, for instance, Sarah Elwood, a well-known professor of geography at the University of Washington, has described VGI as potentially one of the most important phenomena to impact the discipline of geography in recent years, and more generally, a profound transformation in how we know the world. Now, back in the year 2000, two professors sitting down to decide what to include in a spatial computing course would have never considered using a precious entire module on geographic information produced just by regular old people without any qualifications. However, in the spatial computing world of 2014, Dr. Shekhar and I felt that there was no way we could teach a spatial computing course without this material. In just a short period of time, volunteer geographic information has become essential to spatial computing as one of its primary sources of data. This is a big and a fast change. This raises the question, why and how did this enormous development occur? Now, this is a difficult question to answer, but many researchers point to a key role played by a number of enabling technologies. First and foremost, prior to the year 2000, it was very difficult for regular people to obtain an accurate position uh, to, for instance, geotag a photo. Now, this all changed when the public gained access to precise GPS information, which is something that we're going to cover in the positioning lecture. Another core enabler of VGI is Web 2.0, or the technological transition of the internet from a read-only experience for most users to one in which it is common for web users to both consume and contribute information. 
Those of you who are old enough to remember the year 2000 probably also remember when Core Web 2.0 technologies, like the ability to review products online and write blog posts, didn't exist. Now, if these capabilities and others that allow regular people to very easily upload and contribute information were not around, uh, we wouldn't have VGI. Now, while GPS and Web 2.0 were two of the most important technological precursors to VGI, there are many others as well. Uh, for instance, the smartphone, broadband internet access, and widespread availability of uh, sophisticated computer graphics. OK, so you should now have a basic understanding of the definition and historical context of volunteered geographic information. Let's do a few quick multiple choice and true-false questions to test your knowledge so far. As you might guess from the different population that is producing geographic information, that is, people without formal qualifications, and the different means by which this information is produced, that is, outside of official agencies, VGI as a whole displays very different properties than traditional geographic information. Understanding these differences and learning how to adapt to them are integral to your ability to successfully use VGI in spatial computing systems. In the words of Elwood and colleagues, VGI requires rethinking many of the important concepts that geographers have previously used to understand geographic information, its uses, and its impacts. Now, the goal of the next few modules will be to inter introduce you to uh, what is known about how VGI is produced, the resulting properties of VGI, and how to control for or take advantage of these properties in VGI-based spatial computing technologies.